again everyone welcome back to timeless testimonies you might be expecting the final video in a series I'm doing on the first testimony found in volume 5 and that's what I thought I would be doing next too however this morning when I opened up the testimonies for the church my eyes fell on a testimony that I had like all marked up and had little asterisks by it and saying how good it was and I thought Oh, I'm just going to read that real quick. So as I did, I thought, oh man, this is exactly what I needed. It was uh, on the topic of kind of borrowing trouble, looking ahead to future troubles that you might imagine could be there and how that's not a good thing to do and all that. And it was so moving to me that I thought, I want to share that with everyone today. So we'll get back to the other testimony in a future video, hopefully very soon. But for now, we're going to be taking a look at a testimony titled Looking Unto Jesus. It's found in volume 5, beginning on page 199. And here's how it starts. Many make a serious mistake in their religious life by keeping the attention fixed upon their feelings and thus judging of their advancement or decline. Feelings are not a safe criterion. We are not to look within for evidence of our acceptance with God. We shall find there nothing but that which will discourage us. Our only hope is in looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. There is everything in him to inspire with hope, with faith, and with courage. He is our righteousness, our consolation, and rejoicing. Those who look within for comfort will become weary and disappointed. A sense of our weakness and unworthiness should lead us with humility of heart to plead the atoning sacrifice of Christ. As we rely upon his merits, we shall find rest and peace and joy. He saves to the uttermost, all who come unto God by Him. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit. Let's digest what we were just reading. So when Ellen White is introducing this topic of looking unto Jesus, she starts off by saying we can't rely on our feelings to inform us whether or not we are advancing or declining in our religious experience, in our religious life. Feelings are not to be relied upon. Feelings are fleeting. They can be affected by so many things. Even the state of our health can determine whether or not we feel a certain way. And Satan can bring upon us certain feelings. And if we were to go by every feeling that we had, every feeling that we experience, well, we'd be many of us at least, would be very changing from moment to moment because our feelings can change from moment to moment. So we're not to look at ourselves, we're not to look within for evidence of our acceptance with God, we're to look unto Jesus. And when we look to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, what do we see? And that's not just a cliche type question that I'm asking. I think it's really important for us to purposely or purposefully examine the life of Jesus and see how he lived, really delve into the writings that describe his sayings, what he taught, what he did, how he interacted with people, how he resisted temptation. That's so important. And we're told that he lived his life to be our example. He was the perfect example of what a follower of his should be like, how we should behave, how we should act, how we should think, and that sort of thing. So with Jesus, everything about his example is encouraging, it's inspiring, it's motivating, and it's instructional. Now Ellen White writes here that he is our righteousness. And a lot of people would read that, and even myself included, I haven't always had a right understanding of what it means to have the righteousness of Christ. I used to think that 
it was okay. I mean, I wouldn't have said it's okay, but by my actions demonstrated that it was kind of okay to have a little bit of sin in my life. And I just thought that that was kind of um, the lot for everyone. Every human being would kind of be stuck with a little bit of sin from time to time at least. But as long as, you know, we were really trying hard, quote unquote hard, to do the right thing, then, you know, that that's the best we could do. But I never expected prior to the second coming to realistically be able to have victory over sin. Now, Ellen White has a testimony, and I believe it's in volume two, where she says, um, no probation after Christ comes. And that's a worthwhile testimony. That's the title of it, I believe. No probation after Christ comes. I'll put some information down here for you so you can find it easily. But after Christ comes, there's no probation, but then she also makes statements about how our character isn't going to be transformed at the second coming, that we are to develop our characters now, prior to the close of probation, and that that's part of the judgment process is, you know, determining who is fit for heaven. So I'm going to be reading a few other places in Ellen White's writings where she describes this type of idea a bit to help us get a better understanding of what she means here because by reading a wider range of her writings it will inform us as to her overall understanding and what did she mean by something you know just a, a quick statement in one place what did she mean by that what did she teach overall so we'll get to that in a second but I just want to continue to kind of encapsulate what we read first. Those who look within for comfort will become weary and disappointed because you know we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But when we look to Christ and we see how he was able to overcome temptation and how he never gave in to temptation, he was always able to overcome and to be victorious, to never sin, even though he was human, Romans 8.3 tells us that he was in the likeness of sinful flesh, so he didn't sin. His mind, you know, he thought and acted according to the will of God in obedience with what was right and, and moral, but he did so as a human being, fully human. Now, that's such a deep topic in and of itself, and it's worth treating upon in a future video. So there's so much to discuss in these testimonies, it's hard to cram all of it into one. So we'll get to that in the future, I hope. But for now, getting back to this, he is our example and he showed that it is totally possible for fallen humanity to overcome every temptation. And all through the New Testament, we are encouraged and instructed to do so and we're told that he is able to keep us from falling and that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So if we were though to be looking at ourselves for some kind of assurance of whether or not we were in accordance with the law, we would find failure at least up until the present and we only ever have up until the present the future doesn't exist yet so we always have a choice in the moment of whether or not we are going to choose right or give in to the temptation to choose wrong looking to Christ we will always find encouragement we will always find a reason to be hopeful and to know that we can overcome rather than looking at how we have failed in the past a sense of our weakness and unworthiness should lead us with humility of heart to plead the atoning sacrifice of Christ. I'm going to touch on the word atoning as well in a moment. And as we rely upon his merits, we shall find rest and peace and joy. He saves to the uttermost all who come unto God by him. Well, what does he save us from? 
Does he just save us from punishment or does he save us from something else? So let's keep these in mind as we look at a few statements in some of the other writings by Ellen White. The first one I'm going to go to is in Christ's Object Lessons, pages 315, paragraph 3 to 316, paragraph 4. Many who call themselves Christians are mere human moralists. They have refused the gift which alone could enable them to honor Christ by representing him to the world. The work of the Holy Spirit is to them a strange work. They are not doers of the word. The heavenly principles that distinguish those who are one with Christ from those who are one with the world have become almost indistinguishable. The professed followers of Christ are no longer a separate and peculiar people. The line of demarcation is indistinct. The people are subordinating themselves to the world, to its practices, its customs, its selfishness. The church has gone over to the world in transgression of the law when the world should have come over to the church in obedience to the law. Daily, the church is being converted to the world. All these expect to be saved by Christ's death while they refuse to live his self-sacrificing life. So these, all these professed Christians are expecting to be saved by Christ's death because he made atonement for us, right? That's the idea. While they refuse to live his self-sacrificing life. In other words, while continuing to commit sins, to do things that we know are wrong, many of us professed Christians are still expecting to be saved by his death. I'll continue. They extol the riches of free grace and attempt to cover themselves with an appearance of righteousness, hoping to screen their defects of character, but their efforts will be of no avail in the day of God. The righteousness of Christ will not cover one cherished sin. A man may be a lawbreaker in heart, Yet if he commits no outward act of transgression, he may be regarded by the world as possessing great integrity. But God's law looks into the secrets of the heart. Every act is judged by the motives that prompt it. Only that which is in accord with the principles of God's law will stand in the judgment. Keep that in mind only that which is in accord with the principles of God's law will stand in the judgment. Continuing, God is love. He has shown that love in the gift of Christ. When he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, he withheld nothing from his purchased possession. John 3.16 he gave all heaven from which we may draw strength and efficiency that we be not repulsed or overcome by our great adversary. But the love of God does not lead him to excuse sin. Let's take special note of this. There's more coming that's really, really important, but I just want to make sure I have your attention. I'm going to read this again. The love of God does not lead him to excuse sin. He did not excuse it in Satan. He did not excuse it in Adam or in Cain, nor will he excuse it in any other of the children of men. He will not connive at our sins and overlook our defects of character. He expects us to overcome in his name. So important. There's more with this quote that I'm going to read, but again, let's give some time to really digest the fact that, that oh yeah, that's right. Satan wasn't allowed to stay in heaven with sin. 
Oh, that's right. Adam wasn't excused for his sin. Oh, that's right. All these other people who have come before us and they've sinned, it wasn't excused. But I think two of the most significant examples are really Satan and, and the angels who followed him, how the whole reason that he was expelled from heaven was because he allowed sin to enter his heart and it permeated his entire being and it spread from him and it affected all the others who ended up following him, rebelling with him, and that it contaminated this world. You know, it's like the example set has really caused a tremendous amount of destruction. Well, God isn't going to have one standard just because it was a long time ago and now just because Jesus died there's a different standard. Right and wrong is still right and wrong. We can't take sin with us. God cannot allow sin back into heaven. So I'm going to keep reading. Those who reject the gift of Christ's righteousness are rejecting the attributes of character which would constitute them the sons and daughters of God. They are rejecting that which alone could give them a fitness for a place at the marriage feast. Let's digest that a little bit as well. This is so very important. Those who reject the gift of Christ's righteousness, and remember, that's not just pretending. It's not a cloak. His, his righteousness isn't going to cover one cherished sin. She says that a couple paragraphs above, the righteousness of Christ will not cover one cherished sin. So those who reject the gift of Christ's righteousness are rejecting. Okay, so Christ's righteousness is being equated with the attributes of character. Whose character? Our own, each individual's person, as so long as it's in accordance with righteousness. So the gift of Christ's righteousness is our ability to have the same victory over every temptation that Christ had. The gift of Christ's righteousness is the gift of his example of what righteousness looks like so that we can follow that example and truly be righteous. Obviously, there's past sins, but God's forgiveness wipes away that record of sin and now we have imparted and imputed to us Christ's righteousness so long as we are no longer sinning. Those who reject the gift of Christ's righteousness are rejecting the attributes of character, which would do what? What's the purpose of the character? Which would constitute them the sons and daughters of God. They, or I or you or we, each individual person, it's not, these are never for just the other guy that's always for us. They are rejecting or we are rejecting that which alone could give us a fitness for a place at the marriage feast. The righteousness of Christ, the attributes of character, of our character that we choose to develop or to obtain by following Christ's example is that which alone, so nothing else, can give us a fitness for a place at the marriage feast. Now, I mentioned the word wiping away, or the, the phrase wiping away, and that's literally the definition of the verb to make atonement. So in Hebrew, the word that would be used to be understood as atoning sacrifice or to make atonement literally means to wipe away. So when Ellen White says here that we should plead the atoning sacrifice of Christ, and when we compare that to her other writings speaking about whether or not it's okay to have any cherished sin or any known sin in the life, we can see that it would be inconsistent 
to interpret her meaning of pleading the atoning sacrifice as to mean something like to cover up the fact that we are sinning, that we have cherished sin. And by cherish, it doesn't mean that we enjoy sinning and we're doing it in open rebellion. It just means that there's something that we have loved enough that we haven't given it up. And that still might not be phrased in such a way as to really get through to everyone because you might be thinking, I don't love my sin, I hate my sin. But when we refuse to stop sinning, then we show that we actually love something more than the truth. We love that cherished wrong, that little thing, whatever it may be, more than the truth, more than what the right thing to do would be. And I think that's something that we should all be willing and even desirous to self-examine upon and to really get to the bottom of it. But I, I want to share some more statements from Ellen White on the idea of holding on to even one cherished sin or how important is it to have victory over every sin. It is so very important because the title of the testimony is Looking Unto Jesus. And when we look unto Jesus, all we see is righteousness. All we see is sinlessness. But if we fool ourselves into thinking that we can never attain to the same life that he lived, then we won't even try for that. It's so very important. The devil wants to make us think it's okay to have a little bit of sin because we're going to have a change in character when Christ comes and we just won't have to worry about that anymore. And while we won't have temptation, we are told over and over again that this is the time period in which probation has been provided for us to develop a character that is able to be viewed by heaven and the rest of the universe as something safe. So let's get to some more statements by Ellen White. It'll kind of shed some more light on that. This next statement is taken from The Desire of Ages, page 313, paragraph 1. If one sin is cherished in the soul or one wrong practice retained in the life, the whole being is contaminated. The man becomes an instrument of unrighteousness. That's really interesting. The man becomes an instrument of unrighteousness. In other words, if we have sin in our life, even if it's just one cherished sin, that is a contamination. Remember the idea of Satan not being allowed to remain in heaven because what happened while he was there? He contaminated the thoughts and the minds of the other unfallen beings. And his sin, his contamination spread because they bought into the idea and they chose to think the way he was thinking and to then do the things he was doing and that sort of thing. They believed the lies that he was promoting. They then themselves became instruments of unrighteousness, just like Satan had been an instrument of unrighteousness in heaven in the first place. Another statement from Ellen White from The Desire of Ages, this one is on page 439, paragraph 1. Any habit or practice that would lead into sin and bring dishonor upon Christ would better be put away whatever the sacrifice. That which dishonors God cannot benefit the soul. The blessing of heaven cannot attend any man in violating the eternal principles of right. And one sin cherished is sufficient to work the degradation of the character and to mislead others. Because again, it doesn't just affect ourselves, it spreads, it affects others. Our example has an effect on the people who witness our example or who are impacted by the results of our example upon others. I mean, it really spreads. And it's not just a matter of arbitrary morality. It's not just God decided there's a set of laws that we have to obey 
in order to gain entrance into heaven or not or that sort of thing. It's not about that. It's not about um, just doing things because someone very powerful, i.e. God, has ordered us to do that. God's description of the law is a revelation of his character. We've talked about this in some past videos as well. And the reason why God cares that we obey those commands or those descriptions of his character is because everyone will be happier. It's the better thing to do. It's, it's the only good thing to do. It's the only thing that will benefit us and benefit the universe. Now, this statement by Ellen White shows why it's so important that not even one sin be allowed back into heaven. Not even one person who has cherished one sin can be granted entrance into heaven and allowed to live throughout eternity because we've seen where that led with the example of Satan. Satan's case shows where one individual with even one little sin, little, quote unquote, where that leads. All it takes is one cherished sin to contaminate the entire universe. It works to the degradation of our own character. If we hold on to even just one little sin and it works to mislead others. It is not safe to allow sin back in heaven. So when Ellen White is writing this testimony and she's beginning by saying, don't go by your feelings, look to Christ, look to Jesus. That is where our evidence of whether or not we are accepted by God will come from by looking at Jesus. He is our only hope. By his life, by his atoning sacrifice, he shows how bad sin is, what it will do to even the most undeserving of victims. He didn't deserve anything that happened to him. And yet he was killed because of the existence of sin. And that's just how bad sin really is. So that act of his sacrifice should be enough to cause us to realize how bad sin is and cause us to come to the choice that we know that it's worth it to just never sin again. Not in our own strength, it's because of the example of Jesus and because God continues to send us encouragement after encouragement, message after message to strengthen us against the deceptive lies of the enemy against the temptations that come to us that try to trick us into thinking that it's going to be beneficial or enjoyable or whatever or even just unavoidable to sin. But we are told that God can keep us from falling. So I choose to believe God's word that we can obtain the strength to stop sinning and that that is where we should be looking we should be looking at Jesus, our sinless example, and striving to exemplify his life. He saves to the uttermost. Saves from what? Nothing that we're looking at here, nothing that we've read from the other statements from Ellen White talk about we just don't have to be punished. We're saved from punishment. No, we're saved from sin itself. We are given the strength to overcome the tendency to sin. And that is true salvation. True salvation comes from no longer being a slave to death and destruction, no longer bringing that contaminating influence, that atmosphere of death to the rest of the people that we're involved with. He saves to the uttermost all who come unto God by him, by following his example, by knowing how to lead the same life of victory over every temptation that Christ led. Okay, so looking unto Jesus, this is the theme. 
So let's continue now in the testimony for a little while. We need to trust in Jesus daily, hourly. Why would it matter to trust in Jesus daily or hourly if a little slip up here and there was okay? Just, we got to keep these things in mind. We need to trust in Jesus daily, hourly. He has promised that as our day is, our strength shall be. By his grace, we may bear all the burdens of the present and perform its duties. But many are weighed down by the anticipation of future troubles. They are constantly seeking to bring tomorrow's burdens into today. I'm going to pause there for a moment because this is some powerful stuff. I've brought up the idea that we don't have to sin. We can, through God's strength, overcome every temptation that should ever come upon us ever again. And the way to do that is to trust in Jesus daily, hourly. He's promised that as our day is, our strength shall be. In other words, whatever strength we need for today's tests and trials, we have been promised that we can have that strength. It has been given to us. And all we have to worry about is today. This is the theme of not borrowing tomorrow's burdens and not borrowing trouble from the future. So it's only today. Let's continue reading here. By his grace, we may bear all the burdens of the present and perform its duties, but many are weighed down by the anticipation of future troubles, by anticipating, well, what if I fail tomorrow or what if I fail in an hour? Let's not anticipate the future troubles. Let's deal with the present and claim the promise that strength has been given to us for our present need. They are constantly seeking to bring tomorrow's burdens into today. Thus, a large share of all their trials are imaginary. Why are they imaginary? Because tomorrow doesn't exist yet. It is the future the only thing that exists is now, the present. The past did exist, but it doesn't anymore. The future will exist, but it doesn't yet. The only thing that exists is this very moment right now, and that's the only thing we ever have to worry about. Thus, a large share of all their trials are imaginary. For these, Jesus has made no provision. For these what? For these future trials right? He's made no provision for the future trials. It's always that he makes provision for our present trials, our present need. He promises grace only for the day. He bids us not to burden ourselves with the cares and troubles of tomorrow, for sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. There's plenty to deal with today, but guess what? It's not anything more than what any of us can handle. There's a beautiful statement made by Ellen White, and I'll find it and put a reference, but it goes something like this, that the Father weighs carefully every trial or circumstance that his um, believing child may come upon, and he makes sure that... Um, it's never more than we can bear. You know, that sort of idea. It's, I wish I had looked it up before making the video because it is just so incredibly powerful and it has been uh, so meaningful for me in my life. The habit of brooding over anticipated evils is unwise and unchristian. In thus doing, we fail to enjoy the blessings and to improve the opportunities of the present. 
Now, there's a statement from Volume 1 of the Testimonies I'd like to read in connection with this statement about the habit of brooding over anticipated evil is unwise and unchristian. That which brings sickness of body and mind to nearly all is dissatisfied feelings and discontented repinings. They have not God. They have not the hope which reaches to that within the veil, which is as an anchor to the soul, both sure and steadfast. All who possess this hope will purify themselves even as he is pure. Such are free from restless longings, repinings, and discontent. They are not continually looking for evil and brooding over borrowed trouble. But we see many who are having a time of trouble beforehand. Anxiety is stamped upon every feature. They seem to find no consolation, but have a continual fearful looking for of some dreadful evil. So it's unwise and it's unchristian. She says that here in volume five. It's unwise because it just makes us sick. You know, that which brings sickness of body and mind to nearly all is dissatisfied feelings and discontented repinings and brooding over borrowed trouble, you know, anticipating some future trial or some future event that is stressful and seems like it would be too much to bear. They have not God. They have not the hope. So they have not God. Well, that's unchristian, right? So if we are followers of Christ, if we are Christians, then we would have God and we wouldn't be repining over future trouble, imaginary trouble at that. And we wouldn't be continually feeding ourselves with these dissatisfied feelings and discontented repinings. We wouldn't have anxiety stamped upon our features and we would be able to find consolation. So we'll just back up a little bit and get this all in context. The habit of brooding over anticipated evils is unwise and unchristian. In thus doing, we fail to enjoy the blessings and to improve the opportunities of the present. The Lord requires us to perform the duties of today and to endure its trials. We are today to watch that we offend not in word or deed. We must today praise and honor God. By the exercise of living faith today, we are to conquer the enemy. We must today seek God and be determined that we will not rest satisfied without his presence. We should watch and work and pray as though this were the last day that would be granted us. How intensely earnest then would be our life. How closely would we follow Jesus in all our words and deeds. I have on my channel a little excerpt from a meeting I held over a conference call where I deal with an excerpt of one of Ellen White's testimonies in volume one. I titled it battle for today. It's very fitting in context with her instruction here in this paragraph. So I hope that you will check that out. And I hope that it's very, very encouraging for you. There are few who rightly appreciate or improve the precious privilege of prayer. We should go to Jesus and tell him all our needs. We may bring him our little cares and perplexities as well as our greater troubles. Whatever arises to disturb or distress us, we should take it to the Lord in prayer. When we feel that we need the presence of Christ at every step, Satan will have little opportunity to intrude his temptations. It is his studied effort to keep us away from our best and most sympathizing friend. We should make no one our confidant but Jesus. We can safely commune with him of all that is within our hearts. Now there's a couple of statements in this paragraph that 
bring to mind a couple of verses. And one of them is 1 Peter 5, 7. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That's from the New Revised Standard Version. And I think it's just beautiful. Cast all your anxiety on Christ. He cares for you. He has made provision for you to be able to overcome every temptation. No trial is too big, and you don't have to look ahead to future trials. Don't take on that burden. Look unto Jesus. Look at his example moment by moment and know that his strength is sufficient for you. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You can take everything to God. You can talk to him as your closest friend, and you will be heard. And if your desire is for righteousness, true righteousness, victory over sin, not a pretend righteousness, not a cloak to cover up a bunch of filthiness underneath, because that's not what Christ does with his righteousness. His righteousness will not cover one cherished sin, but his righteousness is a free gift that we can have if we will receive it because his strength is sufficient to give us victory over every temptation. We can do all things, including overcome every sin, by Christ who strengthens us. And in Jude, we are told that God is able to keep us from falling. Do we believe that? Let's believe it. Let's do it. Let's call on the strength offered to us to overcome every temptation. Let's hasten the return of Christ. Because in Christ's Object Lessons, page 69, we're told that Christ is longing. He's waiting with longing desire to see the manifestation of his character perfectly reproduced in his people. And that when that happens, he will come to claim us as his own. We have the privilege of hastening Christ's return by overcoming sin and proclaiming that that can be done to the world by displaying true unity among believers in Christ and showing how it's worth it to battle for today. It's worth it to claim the promise that we can have victory over every temptation. And it's worth it to just do the right thing. So let's keep that in mind as we continue with the rest of this testimony. Brethren and sisters, when you assemble for social worship, believe that Jesus meets with you. Believe that he is willing to bless you. Turn the eye away from self Look unto Jesus. Talk of his matchless love. By beholding him, you will become changed into his likeness. What is his likeness? He led a sinless life. What is his character like? It's a sinless character. By beholding him, we will become changed. Into what? Into his character. When you pray, be brief. Come right to the point. Now remember, this is in the context of the social meeting, the social setting. So be brief in the social setting. We'll get into that. Well, she gets into that a bit more. Do not preach the Lord a sermon in your long prayers. Ask for the bread of life as a hungry child asks bread of his earthly father. God will bestow upon us every needed blessing if we ask him in simplicity and faith. The prayers offered by ministers previous to their discourses are frequently long and inappropriate. They embrace a whole round of subjects that have no reference to the necessities of the occasion. There's that present need again. Always be in the present don't borrow troubles for the future. Don't live in the past. Be in the present and claim the promises for the present. And when in the social meeting or when in a group setting and you're offering prayer, 
be present there too. Pray intelligently. Pray for what's needed right then. They embrace a whole round of subjects that have no reference to the necessities of the occasion or the wants of the people. Such prayers are suitable for the closet, but should not be offered in public. So those of you who may be thinking, I like long prayers, I like to talk long with God, that's great. You should, you know, have that long communion with God. But in the social meeting, we're counseled to not tire someone else out and obviously, you know, to, to pray for the needs for right then. So we'll continue. The hearers become weary and long for the minister to close. Brethren, carry the people with you in your prayers. Go to your Savior in faith. Tell him what you need on that occasion. Let the soul go out after God with intense longing for the blessing needed at that time. Prayer is the most holy exercise of the soul. It should be sincere, humble, earnest. The desires of a renewed heart breathed in the presence of a holy God. When the suppliant feels that he is in the divine presence, Self will be forgotten. He will have no desire to display human talent. He will not seek to please the ear of men, but to obtain the blessing which the soul craves. If we would only take the Lord at his word, what blessings might be ours? Would that there were more fervent, effectual prayer. Christ will be the helper of all who seek him in faith. Christ will be your helper if you seek him in faith. Look unto Jesus. He is our perfect example. He has given us every means to overcome. Fill your mind with truth. That's his example. That's how Jesus overcame. He didn't just read something once or twice and think, well, now I know the truth or whatever and now I'm prepared he was daily communing with his father he was daily in prayer he was daily moment by moment even contemplating the principles of truth constantly asking for help that he needed in that moment look unto Jesus looking unto Jesus this is what this testimony is about this is what it means to look unto Jesus it can be described in other ways too, but for our purposes today, that is the message in Ellen White's testimony, and I hope that you were really blessed by it. I know I was. So, blessings upon you, and I look forward to our continual investigations of the testimonies for the church so that we can hasten the return of Christ. Shalom.